Welcome to At The Bar. It's Thursday at five o'clock, which means you are hanging out with me and Jennifer um, at At The Very Bar. Nice. Last night, Inez and I had a chance to raise a glass together in person, believe it or not. Um, Independent Women's Forum was celebrating its annual gala and awards night. So Inez and I got to see each other in Washington, but we are now firmly ensconced in our in our homes uh, in New York and Boston. And I'm I'm raising a glass tonight with a little bit of Argentine Malbec. Well, I uh, just jumped off the train back from D.C., so I'm a little tired looking, a little bit tired actually. Um, and so I'm drinking Coke right now because if I drink wine right now, I might just like fall asleep on my keyboard. And that would be bad because we are going to be talking about um, what Jennifer so lovely in, in, in a, a fantastic way titled this episode, um, The Hot Mess at YLS, uh, Yale Law School. She pointed out to me just off the air a moment ago that this actually rhymes. Um, but we are going to be talking about um, some of these unrelated, actually, other than um, some of the key players and uh, the ideology involved, like a series of what could be termed scandals at Yale Law School regarding sort of woke ideology and how the the institution of the law school has handled some quote unquote controversies. Yeah. So over the past few years, Yale Law School has really become sort of a cauldron of cancel culture. And today we're going to do a deep dive into some of those latest controversies. Um, including the recent filing of a lawsuit against Dean Heather Gerken by anonymous students and the recent dust up between the school's diversity bureaucrats and Yale's Federal Society chapter. Um, I just want to say before we start off in the interest of full disclosure that I am a member of the Board of Visitors of the Federal Society of the National Organization. Um, everything I say today uh, is my own opinion and not the views of the organization or the views of the chapter at Yale Law School. Um, I was also a member of the Federal Society when I was a student at Harvard Law School. Um, but again, I, I'm speaking for myself today. And I should also say briefly, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, that I have a parent, a step parent on the faculty of Yale Law School. I have not spoken with her about this and nothing I am going to ask David or talk about has has anything to do with her. So just wanted to get that out of the way. That's what you get when you get a show full of lawyers. You get all kinds of caveats and, and exceptions and right. everything. Um, very, very careful to uh, distinguish our own views. Um, but it's, it's, I think, important to realize that what ties all of these unrelated um, controversies going on at Yale Law together is Dean Gherkin um, and her administration at large, how she's either handling or mishandling, depending on who um, who you talk to, uh, some of these issues. Um, but she has been widely criticized for creating a climate that is inhospitable, um, to use kind of a, the softest language possible, um, to any individual organization that refuses to, to go along with the latest woke orthodoxies. Um, and we have a fantastic guest today to help untangle some of these controversies, who's really um, not only sort of reported on these, these um, goings on in Yale Law School, which I think do have wider significance to this moment that we're sort of living through in terms of um, the institutionalization of this ideology, um, but has also done some of the best analysis on it and has really um, kind of uh, given people who are not like me, um, not, you know, sort of engrossed in the day-to-day -day happenings of, of Leo Law School, um, a look into some of these really important um, controversies. So we're really pleased today on At The Bar to have David Latt join us. Um, hey, David. Hello. Thanks for having me. So David is an esteemed graduate of that very law school, the Yale Law School, um, and uh, he's also the publisher of the blog or Original Jurisdiction on Substack. You may remember him also because he was at Above the Law for a while. Is that right? I just yes. remember as a law student reading a lot of that stuff. Um, and, 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 more, and more importantly, I'm oh yeah, we were talking about this row. last night. Yes, I'm, exactly. Way back when, <laughs> right, when blogs were new and kind of printed in weird fonts and didn't have <laughs> graphics. And yeah, he was a, a pioneer and um, some really hilarious stuff. People should go and look that up, especially his commentary on Harriet Meyer's fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Not the fashion, remember. the commentary. 
<laughs> um, Jennifer was explaining to me about your blog last night, and I was like, so is it like Perez Hilton, but for the judiciary? Kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of yeah. Us um, Weekly, um, you know, uh, yeah, Tiger Beat. I don't know what People Magazine. That was uh, that was yeah, that was underneath their robes, which was before Above the Law, which was before Original Jurisdiction. So I've, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> um, but we have you on here to talk about these controversies. Uh, unfortunately, not fashion controversies. Although I wish we were in a world where that was like all we had to talk about. Um, but as many people who listen to At the Bar are probably aware of. Um, Amy Chua is a Yale law professor. Uh, she wrote a book called Tiger Mom, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. Um, and she's also, you know, sort of weighed in on various cultural controversies, although I wouldn't call her even particularly um, political in, in a lot of what she writes. But um, it's it, it's probably safe to say that she's been in, in the dean's crosshairs for a while now. Um, but could you explain to us this, this controversy uh, surrounding alleged events that she had uh, at her, um, her home and then um, the, the developments in terms of, of um, how this, this whole, um, I don't even, I keep saying the word controversy, but what I really mean is kind of um, a very bizarre fixation on, on, on her goings on at Yale Law School. Yeah, so I think controversy is is a fair description as uh, things go, and it is a very bizarre uh, situation. So I'm gonna have to go back a little bit in time. Uh, it dates back, I think. Well, actually, you know what it really dates back to is 2008 and the confirmation battle over Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, Professor Chua was one of the few members of the faculty who supported his nomination to the Supreme Court. And that was not very popular. And that made her a target of many on the left who uh, viewed her support of Justice Kavanaugh, even after the uh, allegations from Dr. Ford came forward, as unacceptable. So I think that was sort of the, the seed planted in terms of why people at Yale on the left side of the aisle have such huge problems with, uh, with Professor Chua. Then another thing that happened a couple of years ago was her husband, Jed Rubenfeld, was accused of sexual harassment by stu some students and alumni, and he was suspended from the faculty of Yale last year for two years, so he's in the middle of that suspension. And again, he was a reviled figure on campus in some circles, and so now I think sort of a guilt by association kind of thing, like Hillary Clinton, Bill Clinton, sort of she's, I think, being held accountable for some of her husband's sins even though there's really no allegation that she participated in any of this harassment. Although actually, maybe I should rewind. I mean, some of the people who have problems with her, with her somehow think that she was, was, was grooming victims for her husband. I'm not really quite sure what the basis for that is. But anyway, um, that's the second thing that made people sort of upset at her. So in 2019, the, uh, she, so the thing about Professor Chua is, uh, and I, you know, disclosure, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I know her personally, and I would say we're uh, friends or friendly. She's very unguarded. She will kind of say what she thinks, which you can sort of see in her, her, her controversial parenting memoir, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. She'll just say it, even though it'll offend people. And uh, her endorsement of so-called Chinese mothers was very, very controversial back when this book came out. Anyway, in 2019, she supposedly got a, you know, she got a little tipsy with some students and said some things that rubbed people the wrong way. The most memorable of these comments was this claim, which she denies saying, but people attributed to her saying that, oh, um, Judge Kavanaugh likes his clerks to look like models, or it's no coincidence that his clerks look like models or something like that. Again, she denies saying this, but this was attributed to her. So in the wake of all these complaints about her supposedly getting tipsy with students and saying impolitic things, in 2019, she agreed with Dean Heather Garkin that she would no longer um, entertain students at her house, which is where a lot of these parties happened, for the foreseeable future. But that was not specified how long that was. So fast just, forward just to, to clarify the timeline. Yep. The, this allegation about getting tipsy with her students and saying these things came about after she supported Brett Kavanaugh. Is that yes? Right? And okay. some people. And some people suspect that the complaints about her were very much tied to the things that people have issues with, this, uh, her, her, her vocal support of, of Justice Kavanaugh. And one thing to also mention, her daughter, Sophia Chua Rubenfeld, 
later clerked for Justice Kavanaugh. And that was set up well before the controversy over his nomination. But a lot of people say, oh, when she did end up clerking for him years later, because clerkships are arranged years in advance, as people know, oh, this was like payback for her defending Justice Kavanaugh. This was her reward. And so there are all these conspiracy theories surrounding Professor Chua from people on the left. Anyway, uh, fast forward to this year, spring, COVID, and uh, she, during this, this period, this weird period, she had two students over to her place to help them talk through personal crises. Uh, Professor Chu is a big mentor of minority students and first generation uh, law students at Yale. And these two students, one is an African-American woman, one is an Asian-American man, were having some issues with their classmates and were involved in some controversies. And she had them over to her place uh, to essentially help them talk through these issues. She, it happened on two occasions. They were socially distanced. They sat either outside or indoors with the windows open. There was no food served. Uh, there was no uh, drinking of any substance. But again, this is so bizarre. One of, the stu one of the classmates of these two students who really has it out for Amy Chua, I think for some of the reasons we talked about, basically compiled this dossier, which is this sort of gossipy document that he compiled supposedly um, containing evidence that she was hosting drunken dinner parties with multiple Yale Law students and federal judges in attendance. None of this happened. The New York Times, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, multiple outlets looked at this. This never happened. But this student claimed that Professor Chua was doing this. And this student went with their little dossier to the administration. The administration basically took the allegations at face value. And to make a long story short, Professor Chua was uh, relieved of her teaching duties for a small group class, which is a required class for first year law students. And that's a prestigious plum assignment at Yale Law School. So Dean Gherkin essentially accused Professor Chua of having these drunken dinner parties, did not believe Professor Chua's denial when she said, I did no such thing, said she violated that 2019 agreement where she said she wouldn't be um, hosting parties or entertaining students, and also said, oh, you violated the COVID protocols too by having people over to your house. And she was very publicly stripped of these teaching privileges and, and really made to look very bad in, in the public eye. You know, I have to say, I, I think I think it's such BS, to be totally honest with you. I mean, clearly this isn't because she socialized with students or had people over during COVID. I mean, even if she technically broke some COVID protocol or, you know, violated some rule about having a drink with students, who, by the way, are all adults and legal. Um, the reaction and the punishment would not have been to strip her of her small group. I think it's just absurd to think that that is a rational response to what the, what the allegations are. Um, and I think it's pretty clear, as you said before, that these are people who don't like Professor Chua for reasons having nothing to do with her ability as a professor, um, nothing to do with, you know, whether or not she did things wrong. In fact, you know, I would argue, isn't this exactly what we want faculty members to do, to mentor students, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, meet with them in a time of crisis, to advise them? Um, you know, I think that, that Professor Chua was being what seems to be a model professor, and, and I don't know her, um, but it's the type of professor I would have wanted to have in law school, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, in addition to some of the, the sort of political reasons that, that the students or Dean Gherkin may have had it out for Professor Chua, I wonder how much is just sort of petty jealousy on the part of students who weren't lucky enough to be in her small group and to become her protégés. How much of, of that sort of cattiness is going on here? I think there's definitely some of that. There was one professor who was interviewed in all the media coverage of this. And as I mentioned, there was extensive media coverage of this really ridiculous little you know, controversy. But he said something like, all of these students come to Yale Law School and they're used to sort of, I'm paraphrasing, being the big fish in their pond. And then they come to Yale Law School and you know what? Lo and behold, they meet some people who are more academically talented than they are or uh, better in law school. And some of those people become mentees of Professor Chua. And she was on the clerkships committee. She would help them get these 
prestigious judicial clerkships, which are very desirable jobs for law students. And the people who didn't get that mentorship or didn't get those clerkships, I wouldn't be surprised if some of them were unhappy over that. And so maybe they took it out on Professor Chua. But I also think a lot of this is really the fact that she's an independent, uh, free thinking woman who says some things that people don't like. And, mm -hmm. and I think Inez mentioned, she's not even really that conservative. If you actually look at her writings, she's not she's not really a political writer necessarily. I guess she writes more about culture and society and of course, parenting, which was her big thing. And, as a law professor, she's focused on international law and international business transactions. So she's not even necessarily this kind of right winger. But mm -hmm. if you endorse Justice Kavanaugh, uh, that already is kind of enough to put you in the crosshairs of some people. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I worry this is kind of a, a general question, but I, you know, what do you think is going to happen, whether at Yale or, or at other academic institutions to a culture of um, both mentorship and discussion mm -hmm. and and kind of open because I, I totally agree with Jennifer. I mean, I, I think that's kind of the ideal. The academic ideal is that you are, you know, um, this isn't high school. I definitely had you know beers with some professors of mine. Um, and that that those were some of the best conversations, some of the things that I learned the most about it. And certainly for people who are trying to build a career in law and, as you say, go through these like prestigious clerkships, um, you know, it's it's kind of a necessity to to have at least one professor who is going to, um, you know, write you recommendations, mm -hmm. who's going to like know you in a way that's not just your score um, in in a class um or, or like your rank, or I, I guess there aren't that many law schools that do ranking anymore, but um, you're going to need to develop those relationships. And it's a large part of, of sort of the prestige of these institutions are offering at all. Do you think that that kind of um, academic environment and this the relationships that develop there are going to continue to be possible, um, not just because here, I, I agree with Jennifer, she's being targeted because she's not, I won't even say on the right, but like not of the woke left. Um, but it seems like the particular type of students um, who are going to be offended or, or going to file a dossier, right, with um, it seems like that level of offense is wholly incompatible with academic discussion, which we'll get to, I think, in a more precise way when we talk about the next controversy um, that happened in the law school. But do you think that it's compatible with a large part of what the law, like a small law school like this is actually offering that culture. Yeah, so I'm a graduate of Yale Law School and I went there in large part because I wanted this small environment. I went to a very large undergraduate school and I wanted to have interactions with professors and get to know professors. That's why people go to Yale. But I think what you're seeing at Yale, and this is important because it's reflected in other campuses, other elite institutions, is you're seeing this kind of infantilization of the students. Jennifer mentioned that, look, these are all adults. They're all of, you know, they're, they're all, you know, maybe there's some prodigies, but they're generally over 21. They're able to drink. They're able to conduct themselves. They're able to speak out for themselves. But the university is sort of taking this, this sort of nanny paternalistic role and trying to police all of the interactions with the professors and the students. And, oh, you know, God forbid, Professor Chua in some unguarded moment said some un in politically incorrect thing. And now the students are so horrified. And so now she can't interact with them. This is really hurting the students. This is hurting their ability to interact with and get to know talented professors because, oh goodness, a few students might be offended. So we have to shield everybody from the, you know, evil Professor Chua. It's really, it's really out of hand. Um, so why don't, why don't you, why don't we talk about the lawsuit that was filed last week by these two students. So, because the, the complaint, as you pointed out, did not come from either one of the students who were actually over at Professor Chua's house. It came from a, a another student. And I think it's now these two students that are actually filing a lawsuit. So could you talk us through that? Yes, so the two law students are proceeding anonymously. So we'll call them John Doe and Jane Doe as they're called in the complaint. And they are suing Yale Law School, Dean Gherkin, and two other administrators who figure prominently in these controversies. One is Associate Dean Ellen Cosgrove. She heads up the Office of Student Affairs, which looks after supposedly the well-being of the students at the law school. And then a fellow by the name of Yasin Eldick, who's the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Yale Law School. So they're the defendants. So what did John and Jane Doe allege in their lawsuit? 
They claim that uh, after this dossier went to the administration, uh, the administrators came to them and said, well, we want you to confirm the truthfulness of these allegations against Professor Chua, that she was violating her agreement and hosting these parties. And we want you to file your own complaint against her. The students refused. They said, Professor Chu has been a, you know, nothing but a good mentor and professor to us. And there were no drunken dinner parties. The two of us went over there on two occasions, some afternoon, sat in her backyard or in her living room with the windows open. There were no parties. There were no federal judges. There was no booze. And so we're not going to sign this. So we're not going to confirm these co allegations because they're not true. So then what happened was the administrators apparently pressured them, according to this lawsuit, you know, day after day. There was one week where apparently they reached out to these students each day of that week to try and get them to make complaints against Professor Chua. But the students said no, because the complaints are not true. So then eventually what happened was, again, according to the lawsuit, and look, these are just allegations. It's just a lawsuit. We, we don't know. Nothing's been proven yet. It was filed just the other day. The students claim that the administrators, including Dean Gherkin, went to a professor who was considering hiring John and Jane Doe as uh, teaching fellows, so-called Coker fellows uh, at Yale. These are prestigious paid positions as teaching assistants for third-year law students, and they're very valuable in your career, and they help you get a judicial clerkship, and they help you get a stronger recommendation. Apparently, the administrators were mad that these two students didn't confirm the complaints against Professor Chua, so they went to this professor who was going to hire them and badmouthed them and said that the students were lying and they were untrustworthy and he shouldn't hire them. And in the end, neither of these students got a Coker Fellowship. The students were thinking about applying for judicial clerkships, but the administrators said, well, you know, this dossier that says these negative things about you, uh, in addition to saying the things about Chua, it said, it said all kinds of other things about John and Jane Doe, that they were uh, dishonest, they were lying about their experiences of being minority students at Yale Law School, all of this other stuff. The administrators said, well, this dossier, which says all, says all these negative things about you, it's making the rounds. So you probably shouldn't apply for judicial clerkships. Uh, and one of the uh, deans, Dean Cosgrove, was alleged to have said something like, this dossier is going to wind up in the chambers of every judge that you apply to. So John and Jane Doe never applied for clerkships. And uh, now uh, Jane Doe was uh, so upset over all this and all of the gossip and the backbiting and everything going on. She's on a leave of absence from the law school. Um, John Doe is still there. He's a 3L student, but um, he did not get that fellowship. He has not lined up a clerkship. Um, and so this lawsuit alleges that essentially they were blackballed from career opportunities because they would not um, point fingers at Professor Chua. And they claim they were blackballed uh, by Dean Gherkin, correct? Dean Gherkin and the two other administrators, yes. Right. So one of the administrators that you talked about, Yassine Eldick, also features prominently in other controversies swirling around Yale. And I think that's sort of interesting because, you know, if you remember Bonfire the Vanities by Tom Wolfe, there was always this man with the gold earring lurking, right, whenever there was going to be trouble. And this Yassine Eldick character is sort of, in my view, Yale's man with the golden earring. And so tell us, David, who he is, what his job is, and how he connects to the other controversies that are swirling around Yale, Yale Law School today. So Yassine Eldick, he's actually a graduate of your uh, alma mater. He's a Harvard Law School graduate. He worked at a law firm for a few years, I believe, and and now has entered the DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion space. And he has been in the role of DEI director at Yale Law School. He's not very many years out of law school, and he has not been in the DEI space for even that whole time. So he is, to be honest, um, a somewhat inexperienced administrator, which may explain some of the issues. I mean, some of the problems may be because of, you know, you know, I don't know, you could say um, ill intent, but maybe some of the problems are just inexperience. Anyway, he's this new, relatively green administrator, and he does keep popping up in the various controversies and scandals. So as I mentioned, he was one of the administrators who allegedly pressured these two students to um, allegedly lie about Professor Chua. And then there was a more recent controversy. Um, should I go into that one now? Yes, uh, I think this is a, per a perfect segue. So there was a 2L law student at Yale Law School. Uh, he's gone public, so I'll use his name. His name is Trent Colbert. He is actually part Native American, a Cherokee, I believe. 
And he is a member of both the Native American Law Students Association and the Federalist Society, which is, of course, the very prominent leading organization of conservative and libertarian law students and lawyers. So he's a member of the Federalist Society, which obviously is not a very popular organization on the left. Yale Law School is predominantly liberal or progressive, left-leaning, FedSoc, as it's called. It's not exactly everybody's favorite organization on campus. Uh, disclosure, um, back in the late 90s, I was an officer of Yale Federalist Society. Um, I'm, no, I'm no longer you know, technically a member of the society, but I do have some sympathy for the people who, you know, who hold these views in law schools and, and try not to, to get bullied for having these views. Anyway, Trent is a member of NALSA, the Native American Law Students Association and Federalist Society. There's this party for Constitution Day on September 17, and he sends out an email to the members of NALSA. The party's being co-sponsored by FedSoc and NALSA. And he sends out this irreverent, breezy, slangy kind of email. Oh, saying actually, something. David, let me stop you a second. I think we have a copy of the email. I'm yes, put it perfect. Up. And yep. if you want to read it or- yeah. So, uh, yeah. sup, Nalsa, what's, what's up? Hope you're all still feeling social. This Friday at 7.30, we will be christening our very own, soon to be world-renowned Nalsa Trap House by throwing a Constitution Day bash in collaboration with FedSoc. Planned attractions include Popeye's chicken, basic bitch American themed snacks like apple pie, etc., a cocktail station, assorted hard and soft beverages, and most importantly, the opportunity to attend the Nalsa Trap House's inaugural mixer. Hope to see you all there. So that's the email that he sent. And within minutes of it being sent, it got posted to the uh, group me. It's kind of like a Slack. It's a messaging app for all of the 2L uh, second year law students at Yale. And one of Trent's classmates, the president of BALSA, the Black Law Students Association at Yale, basically read the email that I just read to you as an invitation to a blackface party. Now, what I just read doesn't say anything of the sort, but here's her reasoning. She says, Trap House, which Trent told me in an interview, he just kind of thought of as party house or, you know, frat house without the frat. And if you look at Urban Dictionary and stuff like that and in social media, it's often used like that, party house. Or like my crib. Yeah, or exactly. For, or for that matter, Chapo Trap House, which is a yes, very popular sort of dirt bag left podcast. Yes, exactly. So there's that prominent podcast uh, founded by three white guys called Chapo Trap House. No one's complained about that name. But, you know, if you do know the origins of Trap House, I think dating back a couple of decades, Originally, it was sort of like crack house or urban drug den or something like that. So this student, the president of Balsa, viewed this email, which mentioned Trap House, as basically making fun of African-American students and encouraging people or inviting people to a blackface party. And since there was going to be Popeye's chicken, which just happens to be a very ubiquitous fast food in New Haven. I think there's something like four outposts of Popeye's in New Haven. That oh, yeah. happened to be the- it's right there next to the law school. Yeah, exactly. That happened to be what they had. But because there is this history of fried chicken being used in racist stereotyping of black Americans, she also accused, uh, she also cited that as this, this aspect to the offensive email. And then the third thing that students complained about, not just this student, but a whole bunch of other students jumped in and filed complaints. They complained on the group me, which is the messaging app. And then nine of them filed complaints with the diversity office at Yale Law School. The other thing they said was the, what made this even worse, what added insult to injury was the mention of FedSoc, Federalist Society, in the in invitation because of the Federalist Society's long history of um, anti-Black stances or what is that? That's their claim. Uh, essentially, they said that the mere mention of FedSoc in this email, which already had the fried chicken and the trap houses was triggering to them. Uh, and so again, nine of them filed these complaints. And then within something like 12 hours of sending this so, email. Know, let me just sort of pause there for yep. a moment and just reflect on the fact that instead of behaving as an adult or as adults and talking to this fellow who... I don't know if these were NALSA members who filed the complaint or not, but if they are talking to this guy who's part of your community um, and approaching him and saying, hey, look, maybe you didn't realize this is offensive and, and here, here's why, um, that, you know, the immediate reaction was to run and alert a school administrator. I mean, that just sort of strikes me as 
emblematic of the problems we're having in our society today, in particular, I think with younger people um, who really do spend so much time in their phones and communicating via social media that, you know, are they no longer able to sit down and have a cup of coffee with somebody and explain to somebody why what they did might have been hurtful? Or, you know, they're just going to go run and file a complaint. I totally agree, Jennifer. If somebody had just privately messaged Trent or said, hey, can we grab a coffee? I want to talk to you about this message you just sent. And just said, hey, you probably didn't intend this, but FYI, the origin of that term, you know, dating back a while ago is, you know, sort of a derogatory term for, uh, you know, uh, drug dens or something like that. I think he probably would have just said, hey, wanted to clarify that thing I sent the other day. I didn't mean to use the term trap house, really construe it as my crib or party house. And then none of this would have happened. But instead, he was publicly called out and shamed and basically called a racist in front of the entire 2L class um, on this, on this again, this messaging app called GroupMe. It's like a Slack where everybody can see the messages. Um, and so instead of having a one-on-one -on -one heart to heart conversation over a beer or coffee or whatever, they just immediately jumped to judgment and they just basically, right. I don't know, tried to cancel the guy. And by the way, he says that it's a term he used, you know, a number of different times in the, I guess, months leading up to this. Nobody ever pulled him aside or said anything to him about, you know, that maybe he shouldn't use that or that, you know, some people might take offense to it. The only time there was a complaint was when it was in writing and they were able to take it to the administration and somehow you know try to exact retribution. So that seems yep. a little unfair. Well, so, nope. so let's get to the second half of the story, right? Because so far we're just talking about sort of the typical stuff that you know winds up on Fox News or, or whatever, where um, you have the sort of <laughs> hilariously woke students offended by things that like ordinary people can't even do the, those sort of machinations of how to get to offense, right? You have to have a, a degree from your law, law school to, in order to figure out, you know, which part of this, you know, ties back to something that is racially offensive. Um, but, but the second part of this story, and the thing that I think ties it to the first part with the administrators being involved, I think is, is much more indicative of a wider problem, although, you know, the, the sort of overly offended woke students are definitely part of a, a wider problem, but I feel like that problem is highly discussed. Um, could you, you kind of talk us through what happened then to Trent once those complaints were made um, to the, was the Office of Diversity and Inclusion? They, they were, the complaints yeah. were made to that office? Yes. So the next day, next morning, I think, 12 hours or so after sending the email, Trent was called in to meet with two administrators, the same two administrators who were involved in that the scandal that's been called the dinner party gate now, um, uh, Ellen Cosgrove and Asin Eldick. And he was pressured in this meeting to essentially issue this apology. They, you know, they're trying to tell him, oh, you know, you didn't mean anything ill by it, we know, but hey, um, you know, you should apologize for this. And they had even pre-written an apology that basically they wanted to just have him sign and send out under his own name. And this really, again, I'm not going to, you know, this is very, I don't know, this sounds like the kind of thing that happens in a, non, a not very free society. They had pre-drafted this complaint. They wanted him to send it out. And he didn't want to send out this apology because he said, look, um, I didn't intend any harm. And if people are upset, um, you know, I, I want to talk to them individually and I welcome talking to them individually. And he also said that, by the way, on the group me on the messaging app, he said, hey, I understand some people are upset over this. Uh, you know, I, I will happily talk to you like one on one. Let you know, let's let's grab a drink. And he did grab drinks with one such student. But for the most part, nobody took him up on that. They didn't want to have a dialogue. They didn't want to engage him one on one. They just wanted to flay him publicly on the group me and complain and have the administrators lean on him. So and then essentially we, what happened, yep, go ahead. Well, we actually have a clip of the audio. Oh, because this is what, so Trent surreptitiously recorded the meetings, which if it's an in-person meeting is legal under Connecticut law. And it's a good thing he did because if he hadn't recorded it and if the world hadn't heard these, um, these really insane recordings, which you're about to hear an excerpt from, I don't know that the story would have gotten the legs that it did, the traction that it did. So yeah, go ahead. Can you roll that, Inez? I, I... <laughs> Thought you were uh, oh, okay. here. There we go. 
think it's it's the story. I do think, you know, to be quite frank, that like as a man of color, mm -hmm. you know, there probably isn't as much of a scrutiny yeah. of you as there might be of sort of a white person in the yeah. same position. And I just want to acknowledge that there's mm -hmm. a complexity to that too. Yeah. I think the um, the emails association with FedSoc was very triggering for students that already feel like FedSoc. Mm -hmm. It um, belongs to po political yeah. affi affiliations that are oppressive mm -hmm. to certain communities uh, through policies, right? Yeah. Um, that, of course, obviously includes the LGBTQIA community and black communities and immigrant communities. And, you know, and so there, you know, there's, there's just a lot, okay. I think, of social and political rhetoric yeah. that was just sort of on the, on sort of on the periphery of what you wrote and you want this to go away I think as quickly as possible with the helpful resolution of now knowing that like there will be a procedure for emailing mm -hmm. to students about events in the future but also I think that like you as a person want some character driven rehabilitation and I think the best way for that to happen and, 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 and knowing the students I think it would be the most appreciated would be an email where you just explicitly accepted some responsibility and, and just apologized. I, I can't mm. imagine that that, would, that that would do anything other than make you look like a thoughtful, reasonable, kind person. Mm. And that is more likely to, to have this go away, which is clearly what you want. Um, than, than I think any other alternative. Part of what I also worry about is this lingering over your, your own reputation as a person, not just here, but when you leave. Um, and it's just something to think about. You mm -hmm. know, like the legal community is a small one. Um, you know, your classmates are your peers. And, and I don't want you to be in an echo chamber where people make you think that you did nothing wrong. It's not... This isn't a conversation about whether you did anything wrong. It's mm -hmm. about language that was used, that was triggering, and you're just trying to like take responsibility for managing through some of the tension related to that. And I, I think that's just the responsible way forward. <laughs> I, I would not have been willing to, I, I think I would have like thrown something it's so it, it's so like therapeutic it's simultaneously um a sort of ruthlessly ideological one does and does recall you know what you say like a not very free society um but it's simultaneously got that coding of sort of therapeutic language and like we just want everyone to be comfortable while you're being incredibly ruthless i, I yeah anyway but please please explain like the context of that and and um you know what the underlying, I don't want to say threat in the legal sense, but the, the, the sort of um, mafia-esque, like, well, if you don't apologize, you know, what, what would that mean to a law student in, in transposition? Yeah, so there was this sort of veiled, and I guess you could call it a threat, to his reputation and to his prospects. And in another part of the recording or the conversations that we did not hear or read, there's even a discussion about, well, you know, um, the bar, when it decides whether to admit you as a lawyer, looks at character and fitness. And there was no mention up front or in those initial conversations that, hey, what you said is protected speech, and there's going to be no disciplinary action based on this for you. Instead, there's a lot of vagueness and a lot of, well, you want this to go away, don't you? And I forget which commentator, but one observer of this situation basically paraphrased Eldick's comments as, well, you know, there's a nice law degree you have there. It would be a shame if something happened to it. Like just this very sort of vague insinuation that you could be in trouble for this email if you don't apologize. Um, and so it was just so heavy handed and yet at the same time so ham handed and just really, you know, an example of sort of diversity bureaucrats at their worst. I mean, I think it's just, you know, it's. Um, it just again, on you know, the free beacon, which broke this story, Aaron Savarium has done some great work on this. He posts some of the audio of this. If people want to listen to the full thing, he posts some transcriptions of it. So you can really see the full conversation, but essentially he was pressured into issuing this apology that, 
um, he didn't really, he wasn't comfortable giving. And, oh, here's the other thing. So they keep on trying to pressure him and they keep on trying to pressure him and, and all this time goes by. And eventually he says, look, I'm not going to do it. And he has having a phone conversation with Eldick where he says, I'm not going to issue this apology. And while they're on the phone, Eldick and Cosgrove sent out an email, send out an email to the entire 2L class condemning Trent's email in the strongest possible terms and saying it used racist and pejorative language. So just imagine that you're a 2L student and the administration of your own law school sends an email to your entire class basically calling you a racist. Like just how does, because of, because some other students had a problem and complained about you. Like how does that, how does that make you feel? And what kind of effect does that have on people's willingness to say anything really if they know that classmates can go to the administration and basically get you called out for something that you did not intend to be in any way denigrating or insulting to anyone. Well, and also what does it do to other students in terms of sort of threatening them or making them feel uncomfortable about maybe joining the federal society, right? Having nothing to do with the particulars of this email or this party or this person's language in the email. Um, you know, the whole notion that the Federal Society is triggering to people because it's, as Eldick said, affiliated with certain political causes. The, the Federal Society isn't affiliated with any political causes. It's it's nonpartisan. It's yep. nonprofit. It's, it is a network, if you will, of conservative and libertarian lawyers and law students and a home for them to, to debate and speak freely and, and share their views. But Mostly what the Federal Society does is it puts on speakers and panels and, um, you know, it doesn't take positions on legislation or presidential candidates or or any anything. So the notion that that membership in an organization like the Federal Society, which is essentially an intellectual uh, group of conservative and libertarian lawyers uh, would 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 trigger somebody and make them feel discriminated against is itself, you know, really offensive to me. Oh, absolutely. The Federalist Society is a very mainstream organization. It has ties or uh, calls as members or people who've been involved in their events, something like five or six Supreme Court justices. This is not some kind of fringe, crazy, you know, organization. Um, you know, so it, it's just remarkable that membership in this organization could be viewed as triggering. And just to your point again, Jennifer, I've done I've events for the Federal Society over the years. No one has ever vetted my remarks. No one has ever asked to see my speech or my comments before I give them. Um, it's a very, uh, it's an organization committed to open debate. And whenever they have a debate on a hot button topic, they have people on both sides. Um, they don't endorse one side or the other. People within the society have wildly divergent views. When uh, same-sex marriage or marriage equality was a big issue, there were people on both sides of that debate. The society took no sides in that debate. Um, and even though the members are predominantly conservative or libertarian, the only membership there requirement that they have is that you pay the dues. So you don't even need to necessarily even be conservative. Um, I've known moderate people or, or even somewhat liberal people who have joined it. Um, I know one person who was a member of both the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society, which is kind of like it's supposed you know, opposite on the ideological side. So it really is an organization that doesn't take these official stances. I think the only thing they're committed to is the statement on their website, which is a very straightforward statement about the state existing to preserve freedom and the law, you know, judges law. being, yeah, exactly. That's all it is. Um, it's, it's, so I don't know, I don't know why it would be viewed as, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it would be viewed as, um, sorry, that's my four-year-old in the background. Um, I don't know why it would be viewed as, you know, triggering or offensive or, uh, anything like that. And what kind of mes message does it send to students who are considering this organization when, um, you know, this is viewed or declared by the administration to be triggering? Um, it's, and, it's just, and, here's, it just... and here's where I have to ask, where is the faculty in all of this? I mean, Professor Kilimar did come out um, at the Federal Society National Convention last week and make a statement saying, hey, I think the word he used was deplorable, that the, the administration had acted deplorably about this. Uh, Professor Amar, again, not a conservative, um, a, a liberal Democrat, but often a speaker at federal society events. Um, but other than Professor Amar, I mean, at what point does all of the faculty get together and say enough is enough? This is a legitimate organization. 
You have no right to make students feel uncomfortable joining it um, or somehow try to tarnish it as, you know, a discriminatory group when it is not in any sense of the world, in any sense of the word. Um, when does the faculty take back their law school? I, I have been a little bit disappointed why so few faculty members have spoken out about this. Professor Ramar, as you mentioned, spoke out. Uh, one of the articles in the Free Beacon quoted Roberto Romano, who's a professor of corporate law, as um, sort of criticizing a statement that the law school issued about uh, this situation. Um, but there have been very few professors. Internally, I think Bruce Ackerman um, said to some of his colleagues, uh, he sent around uh, 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 an analysis written by an alumnus that he said he agreed with that was critical of the administration's handling of these events. But for the most part, there's been very little public statement from the faculty. Um, I think the key point for me in all of this is the institutionalization of it, right? Again, we're not just talking about, and, and look, I'm not downplaying the sort of crazy woke students angle of this, um, but I think people are quite aware that yes students both at undergrad and at the law school level um, are, are have very extreme views um, and sometimes form these kinds of cancellation mobs. But, but in the past, I feel like a lot of the dynamics of those mobs have been a mob and then an administration that kind of capitulates to that mob. And here the dynamics are different, right? Where you have actual administer, administrators, you know, sitting down with a student and in, a, in essence, doing the mob's work for it, right? Um, from a, a position, an official position of power within the school. You know, um, I guess, what do you think the chances are that anything, you know, sort of institutional comes out of this? Uh, because you, you wrote a, a pretty, um, I think, optimistic, a fairly optimistic, um, not without its, its sort of caveats, but um, of of the ultimate email that the dean re recently sent out on this this episode, right? Um, noting that she did start it off with a commitment to free speech um, and, and some other positive elements. Um, you know, what do you think is going to happen with this situation? Do you think that some of these administrators are going to lose their jobs? Uh, do you think there will be any actual consequences for what seems ridiculously unacceptable behavior for the administrators of the school. Like we're familiar with students behaving this way, um, as bad as that is, but for the administrators of a school essentially to, to try to like threaten their own students um, with career consequences for not falling in line ideologically seems to me to be a new level of this kind of craziness. Absolutely. It is a situation where I would say the, the, the woke students have essentially captured the administration. The inmates are running the asylum. And instead of the administration sort of being an honest broker between students of different opinions, it's been basically weaponized by one side and become a tool of one side. And so I think that is really disturbing. So yesterday, Dean Gurkin did issue a school-wide email speaking about recent events. And it has provoked different responses. A lot of people have been critical of it uh, because she doesn't really explicitly apologize to Trent or to the Federalist Society. She says she is sorry for that email, but she is not super explicit about it. Um, she expresses regret, but again, is not super explicit about it. But I view the email perhaps more optimistically than some because she did reaffirm the value of free speech. She did say that the Federalist Society is a, and its members are valued members of the community, which sadly in 2021 at Yale Law School is not something you should take for granted because there are people at Yale Law School who would like the Federalist Society to be thrown off campus. So for the dean to have actually say they are a valued member of our community, I don't take that for granted. And she also had a comment in there where she said something like, I need to make sure I have the right team in place to deal with these types of controversies. Some of that some of us read that as possibly saying that on the table might be taking Ellen Cosgrove and Yassine Eldick, the administrators at the heart of this, and maybe either relieving them of their duties or finding them new positions. Um, but we don't know. There's been no public commitment to that yet. Uh, it remains to be seen what exactly is going to come from this. I'm just going to throw up, Jennifer, before you um, ask uh, David another question, I'm going to throw up um, another response to that, that email on Twitter. Uh, here from from um, Josh Blackman, 
So conservative and libertarian law students at Yale Law School should transfer out and mass punish Yale Law School where it hurts by denying them credit for coveted clerkships, um, which is kind of an institutional warfare response, right? But, uh, because yeah, but I wasn't sure of how serious Josh was being. He wrote a whole post on the Vala conspiracy about this. I wasn't sure if it was a little tongue in cheek, but here's my issue with it. I think if, and, and look, I totally understand given the kind of climate at Yale Law School right now, if a conservative or libertarian law student doesn't want to go there. But here's the problem. If all the conservatives self-select out of Yale, it's just going to get worse. Like you do need some people there, some critical mass of people to say, hey, there are different viewpoints in the legal community and at YLS and in America. And if one side just self deports from Yale Law School, the institution is going to become even more lopsided. So I, I met a number of Yale Law students when I went to the Federalist Society Conference the other week, and they are a really impressive group there. They're courageous, they're smart. A lot of them have landed great clerkships for what it's worth. And they are, they're being tested in fire. I think if you can be a conservative or a libertarian at a place like Yale Law School and make it through, judges should hire you because you have had your convictions tested. You have mm -hmm. been made fun of. You have been belittled. You have been challenged by professors and students, and you've made it through. So um, I say to professors who are thinking, uh, I, I say to judges who are thinking of hiring Yaleys as clerks or law firms, thinking of hiring them as associates, don't hold the excesses of a few woke students or the missteps of the administration, don't hold those things against the students who are trying to do the right thing. So I think you're right about uh, Professor Blackwood's comment being sort of tongue in cheek, or if not being tongue in cheek, it's certainly unrealistic. I mean, kids aren't going to apply out of Yale Law School when they're you know, at the top law school in the country, arguably, they're not gonna ditch that credential just to make a statement. Um, I really think the onus lies on the faculty to right the ship. And one of the problems here, I know Inez is always very concerned about the failure of our institutions. And in this particular case, and in universities in general, one of the problems is that the growth of the, the bureaucracy compared to the student body and the faculty. And I just want to read a quote from the Yale Daily News. Um, this came out recently, having nothing to do with these controversies. Um, it was just an article about the growth of administrators at the university. And it says, quote, over the last two decades, the number of managerial and professional staff that Yale employs has risen three times faster than the undergraduate student body, according to university, university financial reports. And then it goes on to say how administrators outnumber faculty at Yale 5,066 to 4,937. Um, to me, that's, that is the problem right there. And it expands, it expands beyond the law school. It expands beyond the issue of diversity and sort of wokeism at Yale. Um, it, it goes to the bureaucratization of the intellectual enterprise and the faculty, both at the law school and across Yale and, and across all universities at some point need to push back, whether it's against the Title IX bureaucrats or the DEI bureaucrats or you know, the student life bureaucrats and say, this university isn't for you, it's for the students. And it's, it's for the faculty to engage with the students with as little bureaucracy in between as possible, frankly. Um, and I, I'm, my hope is that all of this sort of creates a revolution um, and, and encourages people to, to trim the fat, if you will, at these universities. I am optimistic. I think we are reaching maybe some kind of turning point in society at large. Uh, look, for example, at what happened in Virginia, where parents upset about the direction of their children's schooling um, elected a governor who pledged to reconsider or refocus on that issue. There have been a lot of private conversations. I think we've all been part of private conversations over dinner or drinks. Uh, where people say, look, I think a lot of this has gone too far. Diversity is a very good thing, including intellectual diversity, but diversity, including demographic diversity, is a very good thing. But, you know, we have to keep in mind there are other values. Uh, there are other things that are uh, important. And I think Professor Omar put it nicely. He said, look, sure, a, a university can, be, uh, can, can consider issues of, of justice, social justice, but universities are mainly here for the intellectual and academic 
goals that they set out. Uh, the motto of Yale is looks at veritas, light and truth. That's what they're here for. They're not here to advance various social causes. And so I think that some institutions have maybe lost their way and the bloat in the administrations reflects that. Um, I guess this, this is a, a great segue to um, a question that I really wanted to ask you with regard to your analysis here, which is a little more optimistic. I agree with you and I'm encouraged by what is essentially a center left and moderate revolt, I think, going on right now, um, whether, and I think your, your um, reference to the Virginia election is well placed, right? Here you have a state that went uh, for Joe Biden by 10 points. Um, it, 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 especially some of the epicenters of that revolt are not um, red counties, right? They, they are um, blue counties. They're suburban moms, right? Um, who are not what you might can call conservatives. I, I agree with you. I think there is this revolt from the liberal left and from moderates. Um, but <laughs> um, but I guess I, I wonder if if the rot in the institutions has gone so far that the kind of things that would need to be done um, to to extricate or deinstitutionalize uh, this ideology would would end up being so extreme um, that there's no way that at this late time with this this sort of percolating. Um, sort of energy on, on, on the, let's say, let's say the great center, um, is going to be enough. And, and that's why I'm more, um, personally more inclined to look at things like the university of Austin or, um, these, these attempts to kind of build around these institutions. And the thing that I liked about, um, Blackman's suggestion, even though it's not particularly realistic is that, you know, look, Yale law school's credibility depends on, um, its ability to influence and interact with the law at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, if you don't have the Federalist Society and you, ha you don't have um, co conservative, quote unquote, clerkships, you know, sort of counting in your rankings, um, you know, you're going to not be able to perform the function, even the prestige function of the university. Like think about how these students who can't read this email um, are going to interact with the Supreme Court opinions of, you know, a Justice Thomas or a Justice Gorsuch. I mean, at what point will they be just unable? The prestige of the university at the end of the day does depend on them being able to actually, you know, work and influence the law. And at some point, if those two things come apart, I got to think that would be when the, the real course correction would would have to happen. Yeah, I think the students are doing their, the schools are doing their students a disservice when they kind of shelter them in this way from anything that might be potentially upsetting or offensive. These are lawyers. They're going to have to deal with opposing counsel who can be really nasty at times. They have to deal with judges who might be raking them over the coals. They have to deal with jurors who might be skeptical of their arguments. They need to toughen up. I mean, again, I'm sounding like an old man, like get off my lawn kind of thing, but you know, law school is not for the faint of heart. And so again, I don't think it's helping these students for the administration to coddle them in this way. Couldn't agree with you more, David. And, you know, I could probably talk to you forever, but time is running out. There, there is one other sort of factual thing that we didn't discuss, and that is um, Eldick's involvement with a third controversy, which has to do with the diversity training that took place at the Law Journal. Do you just want to, in one minute, quickly describe? Yeah. So again, um, check out uh, Aaron's article on the Free Beacon. Check out my Substack for this. But Yasin Eldek recommended to the Yale Law Journal, the Law Review, the most prestigious publication at the school, uh, an anti-racism training offered by a woman named Erica Hart. And this training is just insane. Um, she says things that are arguably anti-Semitic, where she says that, oh, the FBI is... Uh, there are people who may be, uh, so the most hate crimes are actually committed against Jewish people, but uh, she suggests that maybe those statistics are somehow inflated by people with an agenda. Um, there's just, she says that capitalism, uh, that slavery is inherent to capitalism. She says that biology is a tool of white people to oppress other groups. She says all kinds of things. And this was delivered at an, or, uh, not just at the Yale Law Journal uh, anti-racism training. This was also part of 1L orientation, meaning you show up to school. This is your first week at school. And this person is telling you about slavery being an inherent part of capitalism and bio biology being a tool of white people and you know, things like punctuality being um, 
uh, again, an oppressive concept, um, again, propagated by white people. Like, it, just look it up. I can't even, I could go on. It's, it's, it's insane. And this was, this was all, and this was also offered, uh, uh, um, it, was, it was optional, but it was also offered uh, last spring to the entire school. So this trainer has presented at Yale like three times to the entire school on an optional basis, to the one orientation on a required basis, and to the editors of the flagship law review publication, the Yale Law Journal. It's right. you, just look at it; you won't believe it. And, and I think I think it's important to emphasize that this is coming from the same person from the Diversity and Equity and Inclusion Officer. He's recommending yeah. this training. Um, I don't know that he believes everything that the trainer is saying, but he certainly thinks she's good at her work or he wouldn't keep recommending her. So I think um, Yale needs to probably take a good hard look at what their diversity, equity and inclusion office is doing and whether they're actually promoting true diversity um, and advancing that cause because uh, it seems to me they're undermining it. Yep, I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, and I would just add, I I couldn't I, I also couldn't agree more with the way that you put it, David, earlier. It's that um, to add to what Jennifer just said, yeah, they're not promoting real diversity in any meaningful sense. Um, but also, right, there are values other than diversity. The, the mission of the university, even though diversity is a, a positive goal that could be one of the sub-goals of a university, it's not the purpose of the university, Right. Um, and, and it's definitely the, the tail wagging the dog um, in, in terms of, of these administrators and in terms of the way that these issues have been dealt. But, David, thank you so much um, for coming on at the bar. Um, we, we've loved having you uh, explain some of these very what seemingly sort of internal baseball things about your know, law school. But as we've talked about for the last hour, you know, I think these trends are much, much wider. And it's in, it's really important to know uh, what is going on in one of our, our nation's most elite uh, institutions. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Inez. Jennifer, I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you and keep up the great work. Thank you, David. At the Bar is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. You can watch At the Bar on Facebook, YouTube, or IWF.org. You can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, iHeartRadio, anywhere else that you get these types of products and podcasts. And you can check out David's must read blog, Original Jurisdiction, on Substack.com. We hope you'll join us again in two weeks. See you at the bar.